the benefits of the of this kind of training were described very well in so many sports but no one asked the question what's the cost of it like because if you're a coach and you see something effective you can't add it on the top of the things you do without considering will, will it make my athletes more tired will it be time consuming what's the effort can i what's the alternative cost right so it was like a, an obvious research gap for me because if a coach wants to add an extra, let's say, respiratory muscle training, for example, an extra method to their like uh, program, it, it adds a training load, obviously. All right, Tomek, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? Uh, I'm fine. Thanks you. How are you? And thanks for having me. Yeah, man, it's it's been a it's been a while coming. So I'm gonna let you introduce yourself in in just a second here. Uh, we first met uh, about six, seven months ago in the, the south of France. Uh, I was lucky to be invited to uh, this little training camp that was put together by Andrew and Luke uh, from uh, Breatheway and Vio2 Master and uh, brought a few coaches together for a few days uh, down at the, at the Laidlow Center, let's call it, uh, Laidlow Sport Retreat Center. And uh, we were lucky enough to collaborate, work with Sam and uh, do quite a, quite a few fun tests, training sessions, and experiments. And um, I'm, I'm excited to, to talk with you today, Tomek. So for those who don't know you yet, can you give, give us a little bit of your background and tell us who you are and what you do? Uh, sure. For um, over 10 years, at least professionally, I work as a triathlon coach. Um, I work with both professionals and age groupers. I used to be a, a national team coach for Poland before the Rio Olympic Games in 2016. Uh, by association, I, I do come from Poland. Uh, more recently, I transitioned towards research. Uh, I work at the National Institute of Sports. It's like a national research institute that supports all the Olympic sports in, in the country, all the national teams from the Olympic sports. Mm. So I have a pretty decent hands-on experience as a coach, and I'm relatively new to, to the sports science and applied physiology uh, practice from from professional standpoint although i i'm trained and it's since years and i am a practitioner since since many years uh, that's a that's a point that's very interesting i think because we often talk about that link between the field and and the lab and what we see in the research and what is done uh you know on the field by the coaches by by the athletes uh, let's talk a little bit about your your career in, in triathlon uh over a decade in triathlon already so how, uh, as a triathlon coach, how did your practice evolve? How did your outlook evolve from the time that you began uh, until now? Well, it definitely evolved. Uh, when I started coaching, I was kind of, I was still at the university. And um, luckily, I had some good ideas from the start. So I obviously, I made a lot of mistakes along the way. But by, uh, you know, sometimes when you talk to other people, when they look at their practice and their state of knowledge, like 10 or 20 years ago, they are like embarrassed or they can see the big gap. Uh, I changed a lot of things, but I think uh, I also began on a pretty well level. And after three years of coaching, I, I became a national team coach, which is kind of a very fast track. Obviously, I was very lucky with the athletes I started to work with. Uh, it's there is always some some luck to that because you can be a very good coach, but uh, you don't have access to the talented pool of the athletes. You don't have the facilities, the infrastructure, the system behind you, mm -hmm. or you can be an average coach that it's quite successful in terms of the results without having a great process behind you. But more or less, I started working with junior and development athletes as well as the age groupers. Uh, I progressed pretty fast with with both uh, with both groups. Um, from the age group point of view, I, I worked with multiple world champions in Kona or in like Olympic distance races, uh, European champions, national team champions, and stuff like that. So there is like a uh, there is a big group that I work with from the young younger guys to the to the mature mature amateur athletes, and right now I also work with different sports, so it's even more interesting. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the main uh, the main difference now and then is that um, I'm way more relaxed now. I am probably learn how to, um, that the coaches allow the athletes to be great. They create the space, the environment, but it's the athlete that has to do the work. 
he has to like walk walk on his own or her own foot and you can't do too much um he has to do the work you can do the work for him instead of him so it also gives gives kind of empowerment to the athletes but it also allows me to be more relaxed and uh, yeah that's it obviously my athletes progress as well because it's different if you work at the national level it's different if you work at the international level the challenges are different so yeah a lot of things have changed Having worked with such a varied group of, of athletes in triathlon, like you said, the juniors, the age groupers, do you see some common traits that emerge in the in the successful athletes that you've coached in all those different age groups? Uh, you know, I, I, I come from Eastern Europe. So obviously, first, I see the same limitations, uh, the same uh, disadvantages, because we, we like probably culturally focus too much on the negative side. So mm. I, I'm pretty confident that the same limit limiters in terms of the like approach to the sport limit both age groupers and the professional athletes in terms of the uh, attitude towards the the training process the recovery process the lifestyle uh, also the courage to take decisions and to take risks but um, from the practical uh, point of view the the biggest requirement is to do an appropriate work which is hard because uh, it's kind of the end of this process, the one of the last steps of this process. But to, by to, but to do this, you have to create an environment that allows to excel. It means something different on the age group amateur level. It's probably more about managing family, job uh, expectations, about creating a lifestyle around the sport that it's probably... When, when the sport is important, but probably not the most not the most important thing in the world to have some balance. And uh, it means also something different for the professional athletes where where uh, I pretty much think that environment is super important for them. And the people they work with is super important because if you want to be like top ten in the world, you should also have top ten people, top ten in the world people in the room, like top ten coach top 10 physiotherapists, top, top 10 nutritionists, physiologists, mental support and stuff like that. And uh, to achieve that, you, you have to be very careful about your choices, about choosing people. Mm, obviously, you want to train with the people at a similar level or people that inspire you, that push you. And there are a lot of even scientific uh, evidence that if you your environment is subpar. If you, for example, train with lower people, with people at the lower sport level or different approach, it drags you down. There are you no know, research like when you know the darts. When a good player watches the bad player throwing, he starts to throw worse. There are less skilled technically swimmers on your lane. You start to swim with worse technique and stuff like that. So these are the tiny things, but it reflects the, the bigger picture when when the world class environment, like with the universities or with you know many different places, when the world class environment also supports the world class performance. Yeah, it's uh, it brings brings to mind the saying of uh, you're the re you're the reflection of the five people that you see the most often. So that's especially true in in sports and performance as well. Yeah, but these are the these are the difficult coaches because at some level, if you don't have a great system behind you, it's what got you here won't get you there, and you have to change the relationships, maybe change the environment. And it's always difficult. It's usually difficult, especially if you don't have a pattern of a track of records of the athletes before you that went with the same path. Mm. Uh, so you can just follow their steps and have a big hope and trust and just focus on the process. Sometimes you, it's not that easy. Yeah, so, same here. If we look for another analogy, it would be to, to grow a company. You don't use the same approach to grow it from one to 10 people that you do to grow it from a hundred to a thousand. And so along that way, you, you have to evolve. Is, is that something that is, let's say baked in the cake in terms of the process of uh, elite athletes in the, in the national structure? Is that something that, that is taught, that is talked about or, or that is implemented practically in some way? I'm pretty sure it depends on the country and it depends on the system, because if you have a country or a, national team that is successful in sports that consistently delivers for world class performance then they probably had figured it out on to some extent right but if you for example from the country where, where there was no success in the past 
and uh, if you are a development athlete and you look at the senior athletes and they are not elite they are like the you know the third league maybe it's very difficult to and probably the coaching system around them is also third league not the first league it's well it's hard to tell that but you know what i mean it's very difficult to curve your own destiny in this environment when you don't have like a good uh, pattern of, of development if you don't have like things the athletes before you did and they became successful no you, you you just it's very difficult to thrive in this kind of the environment you can be like the big fish in the small pond but that's not the point usually yeah and i can imagine how hard it is because when you talk about the environment about the support group for an athlete or for a team there's so many moving parts so you can't really isolate one and then change only one and then hope that this is the one and then and then draw your conclusions you, you can't you you can mitigate all those uh co-founding factors yeah yeah but in the other in the well but yeah but on the other hand if only one important thing is not working it can be like the end of the well, it can just simply close the road to the to the sport success you can have like a great coach but if you don't have for example a good sport medicine support when you need it or a good it's enough one thing is enough right bad nutrition or you know these kind of problems can also like massively deteriorate the the progress and the the chance to succeed in the levels the full package you need a full package that's mm -hmm. why it's so difficult because mm -hmm. you cannot accept a uh, low level of any important part because it's the weakest link that can stop you from being successful yeah yeah absolutely if if we were to look for to dig down into this performance environment a bit more if we think about the variables that the athlete themselves have control over uh for you what are the most important elements that an athlete has to manage in their environment outside of training well it's an extremely big topic but uh but um training may probably is not the most important thing where the athlete has the influence on because uh, he has some influence obviously in most of the systems in some very rigorous and strict systems this influence is extremely small because coaches take all the make all the decisions mm -hmm. in other systems uh, they are like there is a big empowerment and big uh, big well the allowing athletes to make their own decisions is an important part of the system uh, but there's usually a coach involved but uh, outside of the training environment these decisions are even more important and some of them are extremely big because for example a place where you live you can tell it's also your decision right it's different decision that if you eat a, you know a chocolate bar after the training or like a something that's better for you this is a small decision but you can scale it from you know very tiny decisions that probably should be micromanaged because you should just probably well in ideal world you educate the athlete and he takes all the great decisions uh but uh, but on the other hand some of these decisions are extremely big like choosing the university or even if you go to the university or not mm -hmm. if you change the country if you change the coaching group and burning some bridges behind you because not all the coaches are you know understanding about your development and stuff like that right so uh we can talk about very different dimensions of of it so if we if you had to write out the top five uh in in, in bullet points the top five most important elements that an athlete needs to think about and uh, try to improve and manage better in their environment in order to succeed mm, choosing a right coach and the right coaching group because mm -hmm. i also believe is the athlete's choice choice mm -hmm. uh second choosing the like physical environment that supports his health because uh, well coming for example from Poland when the winter is usually strong you can tell the difference with the injury rate when you train in cold and stuff like that for example when it comes to running triathlon and stuff like that so uh, five is a lot then the probably if I had to choose number three is choosing a right support circle around you including mm -hmm. like proper physiotherapist nutritionist mental support and stuff like that uh yeah i think these three are pretty much enough to be honest yeah so like you said the, the coaching staff the support group and the environment in which you you're going to live uh which is going to have a big impact on on everything that you do you are way better than me to to summarize that yeah yeah <laughs> I, I just try to i just try to understand it um are there any 
advantages in training in cold environments, uh, such as having a hard winter in Poland? Is is there a, a case or a situation where that might actually be an advantage? Uh, I don't really think so, to be honest. Mm. Mm. Now with the you know mm, climate effect, it's probably better, unfortunately. Uh, with global warming but uh, but uh, no i don't think about it as an advantage as, or as um, i don't believe in um, creating toughness of people and toughness of athlete by creating unnecessary strain and creating unnecessary difficult situations i i really believe you have enough of difficulties in life that you have to overcome anyways that if it doesn't serve an extra purpose and you can actually you know avoid it it's better to avoid it so doing hard stuff for the sake of doing hard stuff, if you don't know why you're doing it, is not that interesting in your opinion. Well, you don't always have to understand 100% why you train. Although I know it sounds very, uh, very smart and very encouraging and very positive. It's like a growth mindset, probably yada, yada, yada. But uh, I just don't think that you should do hard stuff because it's hard. It yes. should be hard stuff if it's necessary. Okay, what what can do you have examples of things you've seen over the years uh, of getting athletes to do hard stuff for the sake of it rather than for a, a specific purpose? Well, there is a you probably also saw a number of coaches that uh, base training or on making athletes fatigued and tired yes. without having like a clear purpose why they should be tired, how much fatigue should be present about the timing of it. About you know, well, I think it's more everyone probably everyone interested in sports so so many examples of this that that it doesn't require like being very specific and pointing fingers no absolutely i i have a, an example that comes to mind and i guess it's it also I'm, I'm i'm sure depends a lot on on the sport and the culture of the sport uh when i worked in rugby uh, obviously the guys were used to in amateur rugby here in switzerland the guys were used to, you know, first day of preseason, getting back onto the field. Everybody's taking a couple of weeks off. They're probably a little bit out of shape. And the first thing that they do is just run them into the ground. And that's what they were used to. And and when I took over the team, I took a different approach. And it was more of a progressive approach because the, the point was to build and not to break uh, something that was already that was already weak. Um, and I think, yeah, if, if, and if, usually if athletes understand why they're doing it, like you said, it's not necessary to always understand, uh, as long as the coach knows why and has a good reasoning behind it. I think that's, that's, that's fair enough. Uh, but it, it does help when the group understands what the, what the plan is. I think the most success I had is when I actually outlined the plan for the preseason to them before the preseason. And I said, this is what we're going to do. And this is why we're going to do it. And this is how we'll adjust depending on what we see. And that's probably the way I got the most buy-in from the, from the group in, in doing what was required, even though it wasn't necessarily what they were used to doing. Well, yeah, the, I, I really hope the sport will progress. Uh, so I think it's in, inevitable because like the people change as well. The new generation isn't the mm -hmm. same as the previous ones so sure. so we had to adapt and i think it's a good change in your transition from the field to more the research side of things are there some elements that were harder for you uh, in that transition uh well yeah i had to catch up a lot with with many different areas from you know like mathematic modeling statistics and stuff like that which are like and which are like an elementary things in in in, in science world mm -hmm. and i'm still not there to be honest i think it's like a multi-year journey to be honest uh i think uh i i the transition was pretty smooth because a lot of coaches lacked understanding from the sports science stuff uh, side and um it's not a, in many cases there is not a good communication between what the coaches needs what the athlete needs and what the sports science has to offer uh, you also probably and people involved probably are pretty aware that there is a disconnection between the two worlds, that different things are valued from the scientific standpoint and different uh, things are valued in in like athletic praxis and and when performance is your job, not publications and research and stuff like that. So uh, I think I've met a lot of coaches that were really happy that they could talk to someone from the other side that understood the the reality of of their jobs so i it was a pretty smooth transition and i think that because of the coaching background i had a really big advantage when it comes to buying when 
speaking the same language and being aware about the constraints that are attached to the to the training practices. Yeah, I think that's that's really really important, uh, and I'm I'm pretty excited to to see you now in that role and in, in the on the research side of things with your huge background in coaching, uh, and and we'll talk about a little bit of the research that you're doing now and that you want to do in the future. Um, so that's think- a smooth transition right now because I, mm-hmm. I two weeks ago I linked you a um, study that I was the first author of uh, yes. about uh, uh, respiratory muscle training, which was very thoroughly studied and investigated in the last decades mm-hmm. and the benefits of the of this kind of training were described very well in so many sports but no one asked the question what's the cost of it like because if you're a coach and you see something effective you can't add it on the top of the things you do without considering will, will it make my athletes more tired will it be time consuming what's the effort can i what's the alternative cost right so it was like a, an obvious research gap for me because if a coach wants to add an extra, let's say respiratory muscle training, for example, an extra method to their like uh, program, it, it adds a training load, obviously. From our research, it was between 2 to 7% in really well-trained triathletes that train over 20 hours per week. So it's substantial. Mm-hmm. And obviously, you sh- it should be considered when you design a training program, right? So it's like a very obvious example that I, you know, can add some value because I know the what's the challenge of the coach or the athlete that has to make a decision in the real world. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that training background and coaching background is really going to, I guess, help you mold the questions in a way that is more practical then, right? Because sometimes the research, research comes out and like you said, something has been studied a lot and again and again and again, but then did it actually answer the question that the coaches are asking, that the athletes are asking? Um, so staying on that topic, what can coaches do better in order to help sports scientists do their job better? And then the reverse as well. What can sports scientists do better to help coaches and practitioners? Mm, I think the reverse is more important because I really believe that the sports science is uh, meant to support the performance, not the other way around. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, the sports science is just a support. It's when the athletes in the center around the athlete or the coaches, the, then maybe the another circle as so a physiotherapist, exercise physiologist, nutritionist, mental support and stuff like that. And then is a time to for the sports science. So I don't think it should be a priority to develop it uh, as a, it's just a mean to an end, not a goal itself. Uh, there are some things in sports science that are useful in medicine, in health, health, public health, stuff like that. And I think that's important. But from the sport performance aspect, I think the we shouldn't worry about the sports scientist. We should worry about the performance. And then we should simply work the other way around. It's the it's like the the coaches and athletes need should be the reason to do the sports science, not the other way around. So Right, I really so, don't care about uh, about what coaches should do better for the sports scientists. I really care what can do better for the people they work with, for the athletes, and for the performance. And we just a tool to to help them. And we shouldn't, you know, focus too much of, on our well being or making our job easier. So yeah, yeah that's, that's it. I, I like that. So let, let's go into that. If if there are sports scientists listening to this. Uh, what advice would you give them again, not from this necessarily from the sports science side, but from your practical experience on the field? What what do coaches and athletes need from the sports scientists? I will recommend them to ask it, ask the question, because uh, it depends on the coach, it depends on the athlete, but different athletes, different sport disciplines has, has have different challenges. And why don't we just simply ask what do you need and how can we help and start with that, right? When you work with the team, when you work with the coach, just try not to replicate what what always have been done. Simply ask, what do you need? And that's, I think that's the best start there can be. Yeah, that's, that's, that's great advice. Um, let's, let's dig into that, the research side of things. You talked about a, like you said, a paper that you uh, authored recently on respiratory training for those who are not familiar. I mean, they, they probably are uh, so far, cause I have talked about it, uh, on the podcast quite a bit, but for those who are not familiar with respiratory training, Tomek, why would we even train a respiratory system? Oh, that's a very good question. Uh, and there are the, the, the short answer is because it can 
probably improve your performance or improve your recovery or help with the efficient warm up. But there are many like physio physiological mechanisms behind it. Probably they are not fully investigated right now, despite the great number of interesting studies about the cause and effect, the underpinning mechanism is still kind of uh, not fully explained, although like probably the biggest part is something called respiratory metaboreflex, that when the respiratory muscles got fatigued, the respiratory metaboreflex that starts here suggests that uh, sends the signal to redirect the blood flow from the working limb muscles to the diaphragm, to the intercostalis, to the abdominal muscles to some extent. So the fatigue kicks in faster and the respiratory muscle training can uh, mitigate this effect by, by attenuating and postponing this metaboreflex effect. That's also the, the, the reason because it's not very direct, right? Because when you measure the fatigue or the blood flow in the respiratory muscles, it will change, but only slightly. But for the whole body to keep this efficient and relatively fresh state of the respiratory muscles, they have to take the blood, the, the oxygen, the energy from different parts of the body to keep it, it as a priority. So you can see a limp, for example, leg, legs fatigue uh, kicking in faster only because your respiratory muscles are not that well trained. It's, so, yeah. It's it's a very interesting phenomenon. Uh, I was lucky enough to have uh, Jerome Dempsey on the podcast uh, a, a couple of years okay. back, I think yeah. now. And uh, yeah, for, for those who are not familiar with the respiratory metabolic reflex that you mentioned, essentially for our brain, our respiratory muscles or diaphragm uh, is more important than our legs once we get fatigued, because if you lose your legs, you can still survive. If you, if you stop breathing, you die. That's at least how I understand it. So the brain prioritizes the, the respiratory muscles. And if they get fatigued, uh, the brain says, oh, no, 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 we cannot have this happen. It's actually going to uh, or uh, reduce the blood flow to the legs, even if they're trying to you know get you to keep moving and then bring it back to the respiratory muscles to, to keep them going. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, that's that's what I've told, just more clearly, and you described it way better. Uh, so yeah, but that's but but yeah, but that's exactly that's the point, and that's why this respiratory muscle role was so elusive for many years. But when you look in isolation at your respiratory muscles, there's nothing really that interesting. But when you look at the whole system, its repercussions are significant. You talked about potentially other mechanisms. Is there anything on your radar that maybe it hasn't been investigated fully yet, but that is interesting in that regard that might play a role in that? Uh, well, now the hypoxic training is even more important. Well, it's frequently applied now, more frequently than it used to be. And the trained respiratory muscles and the trained respiratory system helps with the adaptation to the hypoxia. So if you go mm -hmm. for an altitude camp, you adapt faster. You can also perform way better because the load on the respiratory system at the altitude is way higher than at the sea level. Um, there is also an interesting... Uh, interesting aspect of vagal nerve stimulation mm -hmm. breathing and there is some um, evidence that a respiratory muscle training can be an efficient recovery protocol we okay. actually invested investigated in speed skaters for for some time and it's at least it's promising especially when you first of all if you have very short recoveries between the efforts and you have no time for example to take your skis out do some easy bike ride or stuff like that because some short track athletes race like 13 times during two days. So you have like 30 minutes between the races or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And you can do a respiratory recovery protocol, but you cannot go for a run or anything like that, that is associated with the active recovery. We also know that at least in animal models, the diaphragm is a lactate netto consumer. It can suck the lactate out of the bloodstream. It uses it as a fuel. So you can drop your lactate levels by intentional respiration that's concentrated on the diaphragm uh, breathing pattern and stuff like that. And we also did some studies on that that will be hopefully published anytime soon. So as a recovery protocol, as a way to uh, decrease the stress, but also some basic physiological indices like lactate, blood lactate levels, it can be helpful. That is really interesting because uh, obviously... I, I I was conscious of the the interest of active recovery if we want to get 
let's say, uh, all the metabolic markers back to baseline faster. We know that if you do it actively, like you said, you do a hard interval on a bike. If you do an easy spin after, you're going to get back to baseline faster than if you don't. And I, I didn't know that you could do the same with the with the breathing. The, does that does those do those active recovery breathing protocols require any tools, or is that something you can simply do by 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 breathing deeply using your diaphragm? That's a good question. We investigated, just to be precise, we investigated using the tools, using the uh, isocapnic bush way better devices. Mm. Mm. To be also to be precise, we invest our study was based on 39 like world class speed casters from the four national teams, four different national teams. We had some Olympic medalists there, so it was like a very high performance cohort. Mm. What we did was a wing gate test, which is 30 seconds all out on the bike as a pilot study. And then we took the elected samples and some other indices three minutes after the effort and then 30 minutes after the effort. And part of the group performed this recovery protocol and the other part did not. Mm -hmm. uh, the recovery protocol was only three minutes of breathing with breath way better. So it's super, super short okay. because it was also like the first session for them, the mm -hmm. first session of the program. So probably with longer efforts, you could have bigger effect, but the uh, experimental group that used this this breathing protocol had over thirty or forty percent faster leg that clearance than the the passive passive recovery when they just walked, seated, and stuff like that. So I think it's a significant difference at this level. Um, we also did some further studies comparing it to the cycling, to the uh, massages, to the to running, and. Um, we can we can say it's more efficient than than cycling, for example, because you also engage a big mass mass into this active recovery. But mm -hmm. for example, in short track, you cannot really um, change your muscle tonus. You change you change your like the neuromuscular coordination to perform well on the ice. So in sports, when you cannot really have no time or you just want to change the coordination, change the, the like the muscle focus, the muscle tension uh it may be it may be beneficial are you able you said you said it's not published yet correct yeah yeah are you able to talk it's about submitted, that it's submitted it's not published yet but I can, i'm free to talk about it it's no you're free to talk no about it good yeah. uh can you can you go into the details of uh what the protocol what the respiratory uh protocol the active recovery was after the wingate how long after the wingate was it applied yeah yeah it was 20 minutes after so okay. it was the wingate the first initial like uh, sampling was three minutes after the test, after mm -hmm. the cessation of the exercise. Then the experimental group just seated for the half an hour and the, mm, sorry, the control group seated for an hour. The experimental group after 20 minutes, they performed the three minutes of breathing. It was, I believe it was the breathing frequency was 20 breaths per minute. Yeah. It was done with the app for the visual feedback. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, done after the, uh, under the supervision of the physiotherapist. So they were constantly like instructed and if necessary, corrected, just work with your, let's say, belly, just not to go into the jargon, just with the belly, engage the diaphragm, mm -hmm. don't work with your shoulders. Very simple commands just to support the, the, uh, the, the breathing pattern that we wanted for them to, to use. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Okay. That's they... it. Did you, did you, simple collect... study. you know, some, right. you can, it's super simple. You can say it, it's elegant, elegant, right? <laughs> but in the end, it's super simple, right? It is, but sometimes that's all you need to, you know, well, at to least begin with, yeah, to begin yeah. with and get a direction as to what can we investigate, you know, more is, yeah. is longer going to be better or, or, or not? Yeah. Is it, is it worth investigating in the first place? Did we you... also measure the rate, rating of fatigue. That was very subjective when the athlete simple put number from zero to 10. I was going to ask, yeah. And uh, it was even more a significant difference between the two groups. So okay. that's why I started to go out. The, the potential mechanism behind that is like the vagal, sti the stimulation of the vagal nerve, the mm -hmm. vagus nerve. Uh, but it's also possible that sim simply they just have something to do. And if you give them a ruby cube, they will also feel, you know, less fatigued after just simply distraction, distracting themselves. From the, so, the sensation. Also for the investigation, but at least it works that way too. Is the but your question was if it's going to work without the device? My educated guess is yes. 
right? The the only thing we have to manage then is breathing slow enough so that you don't go hypocapnic and start seeing exactly. stars, right? Exactly, exactly. Okay. Um, can you actually go into the potential mechanism regarding the 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 vagus nerve and the, its stimulation? My understanding is that the vagus nerve is tightly linked to our parasympathetic branch and tone. Exactly. Um, and uh, can you talk a bit more about how breathing impacts the, the vagus system and the vagus nerve? To be honest, I'm not really competent with that that much, but it's the I also I also don't think I have the English vocabulary to to you know investigate that that much, but definitely it's the parasymp parasympathetic system mm -hmm. that gets the stimulus. So you, all your like alertness goes down, all your anxiousness goes down, mm -hmm. and you simply relax more. And and it's on the like on the central level, it's not necessarily on the like peripheral level. So you can still probably perform well, uh, but on the central level, uh, well, um, adjusting the, uh, the, the <laughs> how to pronounce it, the alertness level and the anxious level, the readiness level is super mm -hmm. important before the races, before the top performances. So breathing can also be an important factor of that. And it's well known and well investigated for years in, in sport psychology and uh, in mental preparation that uh, breathing is something you can focus on. Uh, the metrics with breathing are very simple. If I tell you just exhale for six seconds with your nose, inhale six seconds with your nose, hold for two seconds or whatever, it's very simple for, for anyone, right? Mm. So it's a very useful tool to, to manage the, the alertness of the athletes and their state, the, like the, their mental and state and feelings before their performance. And mm -hmm. I think it's also like a interesting topic to investigate in the future with some more you know, precise protocols and more precise techniques. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a couple of my athletes that use the Breathe Way Better actually love to use it in the warmups before. Uh, so one of them, Claudia, she's a, a CrossFit athlete in France. And so like, just like the speed skaters, speed, speed skaters, I guess she has three, four events a day when she's in competition and using the breathe way better helps her warm up uh, her respiratory system. If she wasn't able to push herself because of the constraints of, you know, logistics, what's available in the warm up room, uh, but also to calm herself and to, and to focus. And, and she, she uses it before every test when she's in a, in a competition and it really helps. You know, it's always good to have a routine. And if this routine is not harmful, it's already half of the success. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think we are quite confident that that like the moderate breathing exercise are a good priming thing for before the performance. And they you can do them everywhere because as you talked about the warm up, you don't always have the logistic uh, opportunities to to do different things. But you can always rely on your let's say respiratory trainer or simply on your breathing uh, protocols, and uh, you can like replicate them in almost every environment probably um i have another question regarding the the recovery breathing and then i, I want to talk a bit more about that the warm-up aspect um do you do you think because uh, as i understand you haven't investigated that yet but do you think there's an ideal window to use a, a device such as the breathe way better um in in the active recovery phase after an intense session because uh, if we take the the wingate situation for example the last thing you would want to do for recovery is But give them the breathe away 30 seconds after the wind gate because you're still you're still in a lot of pain and the breathing is not going to be easy at, at that point you're still trying to get rid of a lot of co2 uh, do you think there's a there's a window that might be appropriate there for when to apply that intervention well yeah it obviously depends on the next the next event you must be ready for mm -hmm. but, uh, but i would say probably not during the first minutes Yes, because uh, it's probably it can disrupt the recovery in terms of coming back to the homeostasis and stuff like that, right? Because, for example, if there's a gas exchange associated with the hyperventilation after the test, and you probably don't want to interact with that, right? Because the body is pretty smart, the organism is pretty smart, and it has its own ways to come back to the homeostasis. So this first acute acute uh, reactions, I don't think they should be interrupted. There, that's that's to yeah, yeah that's totally fair um going back to the warm-up side of things is that something that has been investigated uh the restory warm-up let's call it uh before before an intense uh event 
yeah, it, it has been investigated. It was proven to be pretty, pretty much beneficial. Uh, I'm not really that much involved into these kind of, of investigations, but it depends on the few factors. One of them is, can you um, can you warm up the, your with whole body exercise? Because if you can, you also usually warm up your respiratory system pretty much. But not always you have this opportunity to like work with your whole body. For example, if you're a rower or a kayaker and there is like a certain fixed routine before the start, sometimes you simply uh, don't have an opportunity to do, go for a jog, go for a bike, uh, row a lot because there is, for example, only one uh, one lake when you just there's a race there and you're just waiting and stuff like that, right? And for many many years, the um, different sports and different teams develop dif different like uh, warm up routines. For example, uh, with the development of uh, turbo trainers and the mobile like cycling ergometers, you can mm -hmm. see people from different sports using it because they cannot uh, warm up in their specific sport, right? For example. Or you can see people jogging in the in the forest near the race area because uh, even though they're not running in their like main event, right? So um, athletes and coaches always try to figure out how to be ready for the for the the, the 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 race for the event, and it's not always associated. It's not always reflects the the specific uh, specific movement of the event, but the the reason is the same. You want to be as ready to perform as possible. And to respiratory muscle training in many many cases can help with that yeah it's it it's really interesting to another thing that i that i think about is just the kinetics of what gets uh what's get what gets kind of turned on or taxed to use a very simple language when you start a warm-up uh, what i mean by that is you might get on a bike and you're gonna you know start spinning and obviously your legs are gonna warm up uh, because you're using them your whole body's gonna warm up your heart's gonna get pumping uh, my understanding is that if you really want to, let's say, push your respiratory system, unless you do it voluntarily, your respiratory system is going to kind of fully kick in once you're in into severe intensity exercise, right? Yeah. So this yeah. this is yeah. where things get really hard, where your rate of breathing gets much, much higher uh, because of all that CO2 that's coming up and that you have to get rid of. Um, and sometimes, I guess, depending on the intensity of the test that you're going to do after, it, it might be tricky to tax the respiratory system enough via whole body exercise uh, because to actually push the respiratory system in a whole body context you, you really need to push hard wind wingate type stuff uh, and so one thing that i see as beneficial and i'd like to i'd like to hear your perspective on that one thing that i see as interesting using a respiratory device to to complement to supplement your warm-up is that you can get everything warmed up properly and then you can kind of focus on that respiratory system as much as you need to or as much as you want to uh, in order to be ready for for what's to come after uh, well i agree with you however i don't think it's that super important i, I okay. think it may be very useful for many athletes and for many well demands of the competition but they're like the real life practice show shows it's it may be important it may be beneficial but that are there are good studies that uh, show it it's beneficial but there are also good studies that show it's not that much beneficial and mm. it's quite difficult to differentiate why for some it's useful and for some it's not useful for sure there is a very small risk associated with that so if you're unsure, you're not taking a big risk if you try to implement that and see how, how it works for you. It's also uh, part of the differences between the two worlds because science is a study of the populations, more or less. Obviously, when you talk to different scientists, they have their own definitions, but more or less, if you think about physiology, it's a population-related uh, discipline. But if you work about the real-life performance, it's very individual. So there is like individual performance signatures that matters most than the rules that apply for most of the people, especially that the top performers or even like top amateur performers are an outliers, right? So, so I guess in, in that yeah. context, we need to try it. And then if the athlete feels like it's beneficial to them, then we're probably going in the right direction. Yeah, and like you said, if there's no harm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But in the same same time, multiple world records have been beaten without resp additional exactly. respect muscle warm up so uh so there are certainly many ways to skin the cat and uh yeah I, I, I like that uh since we talked a little bit about about speed skating so far one thing i wanted to bring up with you is uh, uh 
uh, Niels van der Poel and uh, what he did in, in Beijing uh, almost a couple of years ago now. Uh, he, he followed up by publishing his training manual and explained his philosophy and how he functioned for, for many years to get to that point. And for those who don't have the reference, uh, he's uh, a, a skater from Sweden, correct? Uh, and he got double world record or double uh, world record, Olympic record, both, I guess, because it was the Olympic Games. Well, I, I'm I'm sure he was like a, a 10,000 meters world record holder. Right. OK, so he got you got the five and the 10K uh, gold medal. And I believe there was a world record in there, at least. Uh, and one thing that that stood out in his way of approaching training is that it was a very long process to get to this uh, this. Uh, uh, training state and his uh, and and being able to beat those those records and and get a double gold medal, um, and one thing that was maybe very surprising for some is how much base endurance he did, given that his distance, his five five k and ten k, took him six and thirteen minutes respectively, if I'm not mistaken. So they're they're very short events. They're very intense events. They're they're clearly in the in the severe domain if we if we talk about uh, the intensity spectrum. Yet he spent many, many months just biking uh, at a at a fairly low, uh, at a high absolute intensity for us mortals, but at a fairly low intensity for for him. And and he did so much volume. Talk a little bit about your perspective on on what he did. Mm, I think it's a very interesting case. I just checked. It's it's five and ten thousand meters world records. Both are both are both belong to him. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, so yeah, he's definitely a world class performer. And I think there are many lessons that we can take from him, not only in speed skating, but also the transfer to other sports. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would start with a differentiation be between fast twitch and slow twitch athletes, which is obviously it's kind of a generalization, but you know, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Uh, if you have athletes that are very endurance oriented with a big number of big percentage of slow twitch muscles, it differs muscle to muscle, but on general basis, if they're more slow twitch oriented, they can be very good if if the ceiling is naturally high. For ceiling, I mean VO2 max, for example. If the ceiling is naturally high, uh, with a lot of endurance work, that can they can have exceptional results even with a shorter and more intense intense start, because um, the slow twitch muscles are the the fibers. The slow twitch fibers are the primal movers. Uh, whatever they could do, the source of their athletic success is developing the the engine that is based on the slow twitch fibers. So the more endurance training they do, the more successful they are. In the same time, on the other side of the spectrum, you have these fast twitch athletes that uh, that do not thrive if they don't have a contact with high intensity and fast stuff that uh, engages their fast twitch muscles. Obviously, more of us is between these two uh, points because it's like always there. These are the, the very like the sides of this of this Gauss curve and most of us are in the middle but these two different type of, type of athletes require different types of training and um, if you're a fast twitch athlete it will be kind of difficult to achieve a great success with very endurance oriented training without with lack of the contact with the high intensity stuff without the stimulation of your primal movers which mm -hmm. are fast twitch fibers right mm -hmm. Uh, that's a big practical distinction and you can see systems that supports both ways of training for example maybe he's not the most popular guy in the like popular narration but if you think about Mikhail Igloy who was like a, a Hungary running coach uh, after the second world war and then he moved to the US he was extremely successful uh, and his athletes only use intervals in training and I think they also run marathons pretty fast. I'm, pre I'm well. I I can't tell for sure, but he, it was like world records and stuff like that in five k, ten k. So also more uh, long distance events, not only short distance events. And his athletes came to the track twelve times, twelve times per week, and they only did the intervals. Not all the intervals were hard and fast, but it's a type of the training brought to some kind of an extreme that serves very well to the fast twitch athletes. On the other hand, you have athletes that do long miles all the time and stuff like that, and they're also successful. I think it's one of the most important things uh, in like designing a training system because you have different types of athletes and you can tell that 
in some systems only a certain type of the athlete thrives. For example, mm -hmm. if you have this, uh, let's say right now the Norwegian system is kind of popular, which is uh, at least in triathlon, it's not that polarized as it was taught uh, or promoted for, for many years. They do a huge amount of volume and all of threshold stuff. And all the top, probably all the top athletes that we know of have usually very high VO2 max. So the ceiling is already high. And the job of the coach is to put a lot of work under this high ceiling. And if you do it staying healthy, having good movement patterns, you know, having a decent technique, and you maintain this kind of routine for many years, you will probably be successful, but you have to be a talented athlete and you have to be endurance oriented athlete in terms of your like uh, muscle mix, in terms of your muscle fibers, right? Mm -hmm. If you put like a fast switch athlete to that system, he will be over fatigued, he will overreach very soon, and he probably need a different approach. Like a different approach should work better for him. On the other hand, if you put an endurance athlete into this fast switch, let's make it like super simple training system, he also won't be, he also won't achieve the potential because this fast switch things will not engage his primal movers and his source of the success would be different. So these are like black and white. Most of us are in this gray area, but we can learn from these examples. And yeah. I, I really like the the spectrum that you draw, drew here with the, the fast switch and the slow switch athlete. I guess we'll call them archetypes, right? Because they're not a person. They're just the, the representation of the end of that distribution. So we get an idea of of the the far left and the and the far right and how everything works together. Um, would you say that in general, more powerful, more fast switch athletes have less uh, total tolerance to volume co compared to uh, an endurance profile? Yes. Short mm. answer is yes. Yeah, short answer is yes. And I guess oftentimes it's it's easy enough to distinguish which profile somebody is. And uh, like you said, they might not be one extreme or another, but usually we see somebody tilt one side more than than the other. Do, do you have some good indicators, whether they're, they're visual, whether it's through a questionnaire that can help coaches uh, determine where their athletes uh, stand and, and maybe then from there uh, individualize the training a little bit better? Yeah, there are at least three things that you should take into consideration. Um, first is if you measure lactate, like maximum lactate levels, because if you have athlete that even on the very high intensity stuff reaches lactates like five or six minimals per liter, it's an indicator that he's probably more endurance oriented athlete. On the other hand, if you see values over 25 minimals per liter, it's it's the, the other side of the spectrum. So it's slightly invasive, but it's also very easy. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is when you look at their personal bests, for example, in running, if you look at the runner that runs from, let's say, 800 meters to 10,000 meters in this career, and, he perf and you compare his personal bests at different distances, it can be for the amateur runner, it can be 5K versus the marathon or half marathon. Uh, for the swimmer, it can be, let's say, uh, 100 meter versus 1500 meter and stuff like that. So simply by anal analyzing his performance, the curve of slowing down is also extremely helpful. But last and not least, we are usually very satisfied and happy with things we are good at. And you yes. can tell which, which kind of training at least enjoy the most. So you can expect that if you go for a demanding long bike ride, it will be very fun for the and very like uh, exciting for the endurance oriented athletes but if you want to design a you know shorter ride sprinting to every city sign it will be it will be more fun to the these fast switch oriented athletes and finally you can see the fatigue pattern after all of these things i've mentioned uh, if because some some athletes even fast switch athletes when fresh they can enjoy these long hard rides, for example, on a regular basis, but their recovery will be longer, usually. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, yeah, yeah, so that's it. Especially for the fast switch athletes, a lot of endurance work with, will will get them very fatigued, way more fatigued than the, the, the endurance-oriented athletes. And of course, there are more variables to that, but yeah. But yeah, those are the main indicators. Uh, it's really interesting because I, I definitely see that in, I work primarily in CrossFit. Uh, and so I, I see a wide range of uh, athletic abilities and, and profiles. Uh, 
Uh, obviously, in CrossFit now, it's very much tilting towards the more powerful athlete because you need the muscle mass, you need the strength. It's very hard to be at a at a high level if you don't have that those prerequisites. Uh, but then within that, you can you can definitely see those that uh, prefer the longer stuff or those that prefer the shorter stuff, and that usually tells the, us the longer sets, yeah, stuff like that. Exactly, and and that is usually a good indicator at least for me and and i'm talking here of of, uh, of athletes or folks that have done very little endurance structured training uh, but usually what i'll tend to do is if i get an endurance profile i'll prescribe to them some higher intensity stuff uh, not all the way to the right of, of the of the distribution yet because sometimes they tolerate it really it's really hard for them to even do those efforts and like you said they're going to be taxed so much by those uh, super intense sprints. So I'm not going to send them to the deep end right away, but we'll, you know, work up into some VO2 stuff uh, and then we'll go to the right a bit more. And then the other side is for the very par powerful athlete that are better on the, you know, three minute, five minute stuff. We'll go and do some tempo and some, and some threshold stuff. Uh, and they're not obviously super advanced training plans. They're very simple, but usually it's enough to maybe kind of, just fill the gap a little bit in their weaknesses. And then obviously, uh, would you say that it's interesting, it's more interesting to work on our weaknesses far away from competition and then kind of come back towards what we're strong at closer to? Yeah, I'm disappointed because I have to agree again. We cannot really discuss that. <laughs> but yeah, but I totally agree that mm -hmm. probably you should work about your strength. Well, what makes you successful is your strong sides, right? So obviously you shouldn't have any very obvious weaknesses. And in a periodization framework, it's probably better to work on your weak sites in the very beginning, far from the you know, the most important training and racing period. And then also use this uh, demanding and sessions that fit to your strengths uh, as a, like a mental advantage, something that gives you confidence, something that makes you sure that you're on the right path because also before the competition, there is a, the stress level is higher and stuff like that so yeah but i'll definitely think that you should play to your strengths not necessarily focus on your weaknesses that is one thing but the other thing is like the demands of the competition so you cannot there are probably like a dozen of dimensions we could discuss right and even this intensity distribution between this fast twitch and slow twitch athletes it's also only one of the many many dimensions so but yeah i will totally agree with you Let's extend that to other non-endurance sports. What is your perspective on endurance, on conditioning work for sports that are not endurance-based to begin with? Uh, well, there are a few aspects that I think should be discussed. One is that the um, it is changing because if you look at the athletes that came to the sport 10 or 20 years ago, they had a pretty good aerobic base from simply living, going to school, playing on outside, having like a physical education on the way higher level. You can probably see in most of the Western countries that the physical fitness of young people declines, but it and it it, it has it has its consequences. So I think even if you could if you could get away with very limited uh, conditioning some years ago, right now we need to prepare these athletes better. But it's not only about the conditioning, it's also about general strength and conditioning, motoric preparation, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, you can see man many coaches that were very successful many years ago. They have the same system as they had many years ago, but now the athletes changed, so the system doesn't work as well as it used to. So I think, generally speaking, um, there is a big gap in, in conditioning between the, the athletes that are coming and the demands of most of the competitions. And uh, the other important thing is that when you look at the like lifelong health benefits from sport, they usually come in big part from the conditioning uh, aspects of training. Obviously, if the muscle mass drops after a certain age, it's also super important. But when you look at, at cardiovascular diseases, and the this kind these types of like risk factors they are usually associated with simply being physical active in this endurance aspect when the heart gets the stimulus for a moderate amount of time not for a few seconds right mm -hmm. so at least these two things uh, make me think that uh, 
it is important and it's probably more important than most of us thought a few years ago. Right. That's a very good point that the the demographic is changing. The like you said, the fitness level even of our of our youngsters is changing as well because we're not spending as much time outside. We're not running around all day. And and that in and of itself does create a really good base on which you can overlay, you know, more intense stuff and more training after. But like you said, if you if 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 all the young people are sitting inside all day and only spend an hour a week moving because they were told to in school. Uh, we can imagine that their work capacity is not going to be the same when they get to be 16 and 17. Is Talk about that influence too, because that, that is a, a point that is very interesting to me. It's when, when people say, well, I don't play an endurance sport. I don't practice an endurance sport, so I don't need to do endurance training. Uh, the way that I see it is that the endurance training for a non-endurance sport just gives you the ability to train more and to recover better. Is that, does that, does that make sense? Yeah, it makes totally sense. And also in many sports, you can see that you compete more now than you used to. For mm -hmm. example, if you like look at the team sports, uh, they the yeah. seasons are longer, there are more games, there are like preseason games, there are the playoffs, there are different kinds of competition. So if you want to be ready for that, if you want to recover on a like regular basis from that, you also have to have a very solid endurance base. So it's slightly different if you have like a short season and a long preparation period and stuff like that. But in many sports also, you have a very long racing season. So the higher the aerobic base at the beginning of this season, the, 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 the faster you will be in the, in the second part even of, the, of, the, of this period. So yeah, but definitely the, having a good aerobic base allows you to recover faster. And uh, it's a big advantage in, in these different uh, different aspects like speed or strength or power. How to find the right balance between, you know, doing the right amount that's going to help you get better at your sport and then just doing too much just for the sake of it and then, and then going too far with it. Mm, you can be tracking performance, you know, it's like uh, what was the saying that the best monitoring tool is coaches paying attention. So if you pay attention to the performance of your athletes, if they are sharp and stuff like that, with this high intensity stuff, with this power stuff, with this speed stuff, you can probably tell the negative influence of the big aerobic work on the high intensity aspects of, of performance. Uh, if you focus too much on the threshold stuff, it will be even more visible because uh, building an aerobic base starting at the low aerobic level, like uh, under the aerobic threshold, is probably less influential in a negative way for your speed and stuff like that than doing a lot of threshold stuff. So uh, one thing is having this uh, conditioning sessions polarized in terms of the whole program. I think that's, that's a must. Uh, but uh, coming back to your topic, simple paying attention, because you can tell usually when the speed performance or power performance of your athletes decline, and uh, it's slightly a trial and error about checking how much aerobic work can I do without taking away the quality of the stuff that requires quality to be to be like beneficial for the performance. And obviously, you can also periodize that. So there can be a, a period when you accept there is a compromise, there is a trade off between the two. Uh, but Again, closer to the competition, you focus more on the demands of the competition. So you probably want your athletes to perform quality se sessions with high quality. And the other thing is like the individual profile, because for some people, it may be not a one season work. It it's not a work for one season. If you think about Olympic cycles, for example, with some um, speed skating sprinters, we deliberately focus over focus in terms of a one season over focus on aerobic conditioning to have a huge base, a bigger base, entering into last 20 months before the Olympic Games. So, uh, because it's their like weakness, it's the, the weakness is so big that we know we cannot cover it with having a very balanced program and making them like happy, sharp and fresh all the time. Mm -hmm. so, so you have to go a little farther to kind of overcompensate for that weakness. So then you can come back to your strengths and, and actually train them as much as you need to, to, to win. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I guess it comes back to planning intelligently, knowing what your goal is, and then working back from the end goal and knowing what you have to work on. And like you said, making compromises and sacrifices far from the competition on your on your strengths uh, can be worthwhile if you have a, an intelligent plan to work back towards them. 
obviously it's also kind of risky approach because first of all you have to as we started our conversation we discussed that it's good that the athletes know the why behind the, yes. the playing choices and in this case when it's a very long term so there aren't many small successes that can build you during the process it's super important to have an athlete informed of why. but on the other hand it's super helpful if you know them what where do you need to do to be to be really successful so for example if you want to fight for an olympic medal what is the level of certain physiological indices parameters that that are required to to fight for this medal because for example in our example uh if your endurance and aerobic base is already there there's probably very limited need to improve that if the other aspects of your performance are subpar mm -hmm. but if there is a big gap then you probably need a lot of work on that it's more than one season but i think it's one of the most uh, well-guarded knowledge is to know what's the profile of the champion because in i'm pretty sure many national institutes of sports have this idea maybe not all the country is good at all the sports and have a lot of great history of the success in this sport but for example i will try to be neutral here if you look at the um, dutch speed skating which is like a powerhouse since decades uh, i am pretty sure their coaches know what's the difference between the olympian the olympian that wins medal and the national team member that doesn't go to the olympics and uh it's uh, like the crucial knowledge to know where do you want to go like very objectively obviously mm -hmm. the sport changes all the time so you have to like you cannot you know focus too much on the fixed numbers from four years ago but uh, i think it's a uh, very super useful knowledge in the same time it's not widely shared knowledge right it's it's well it's well obviously. guarded obviously it's it's well gar guarded uh guarded as you said i, I want to come back to something you said about uh, like you said, threshold work is more demanding than low intensity work, which which makes sense. Just nervous standpoint, metabolic standpoint, overall global fatigue standpoint, that makes sense. One thing, uh, a study that I saw that I found really interesting, they were looking at, if I remember correctly, repeat sprint ability in elite soccer players. And uh, they measured a whole bunch of parameters and the two parameters that explain, I think it was 0.89 uh, of the model was fastest time on a sprint. So obviously, if you want to repeat sprints, you have to be fast in the first place. That that makes sense. Yeah. And the second metric was speed at uh, the second threshold. Uh, and that's something that didn't it, it did surprise me it did surprise me uh i just i just didn't see that relationship between the recovery and and that second threshold now now i do the way i understand the second threshold now and i'd like i'd like your your perspective on that your second second threshold is kind of an illustration of the maximum amount of oxygen you can bring to the body as in once we go above that second threshold we can't bring more we we're, we keep consuming more right vo2 goes up but then how much you can bring has uh, kind of stops at the second threshold you can't do any more uh, and that's why that delta is created or, or that w prime is, as we can maybe call it um so talk about the influence of that second threshold and that threshold work in allowing uh, maybe team sport athletes to better repeat sprints mm, there are two different dimensions that are important here first is how to improve this threshold and mm -hmm. because it's it will be like the takeaway from our probably this part of the conversation but the practical thing is that all the efforts above the second threshold the higher threshold cost your body way more so the higher the threshold every sprint uh, is costing you less because the greater part of every sprint you perform with in intensity not in terms of the speed or power but in terms of physiological framing under the second threshold so the fatigue accumulates slower and this this cost um i i'm not sure if it's correct however it's widely used to use this atp usage as an example but yeah. if you could oversimplify a lot and model it that these uh, efforts above the second threshold cost you 15 to 20 times more than the efforts are under the threshold so to extremely oversimplify it if you have a, a threshold on the bike at 300 watts when you every watt above the 300 costs you way way more so so yeah so that's it and it's only the metabolic uh, metabolic aspect because there's also the neuromuscular aspect mm -hmm. like the contraction force and stuff like that 
mm-hmm. from the metabolic state uh, standpoint the higher the second threshold is the better the movement economy in in a lot of intensity zones not not in all intensity zones but in plenty intensity zones that are uh, useful in performances ranging from probably even two minutes to a uh, few hours it's it's one of the most important things and if you look at the determinants of the performance the 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 second threshold i like the name by the way i because you know there's always big confusion between the <laughs> Uh, like that or anaerobic. I think it's simpler. Yeah, just it's the yeah, second yeah. one. There's, there's, a, there's the first one and the second one. Yeah. We are everyone knows what we are talking about. But yeah, in in many many sports and in many many distances or timed events, it's one of the biggest performance determinants. Okay, so now let's get to what is the best way to improve it for a rugby player or a soccer player if he wants to recover better between each each play. Yeah, there will be a huge difference between the endurance athlete because uh, the threshold also improves with a lot, a lot of easy aerobic work. But a lot, I mean, 20 hours plus per week. Even VO2 max improves with this kind of work, which is surprising and probably not established in scientific research. Or there are, you know, at least a few different ideas about improving VO2 max and its trainability. But I have seen many times during few few years of endurance training, improvements like 50% of VO2 max when the athletes were focusing mainly on the very easy and aerobic intensity under the first threshold. Mm-hmm. But obviously with this kind of volume, we can't we can't we can't apply this uh, kind of volume to the rugby player or team sports player, right? That would be mm, that would be impossible without you know sacrificing the things that are way more important. So one thing that we can use is microdosing, which I'm pretty sure that Steve Ingham used with the uh, heptathlon athletes in UK. Mm. And they simply used a lot of small injections of uh, threshold work uh, spread across the whole week. So we didn't create a big fatigue in a certain, you know, in, a, in a one, one, one time point. But the overall work for weeks was there. So I think it's very practical way because you can imagine going three to eight minutes around the threshold three to four times per week without having a big uh, fatigue that it causes mm-hmm. for what an athlete. So, uh, so this is the first the, the first thing I, I have in mind. But the the most conventional approach is that having two to three uh, around the threshold sessions during the week. Obviously, if you want to improve the threshold, sometimes you have to work above the threshold. Sometimes you have to work. Uh, under the threshold uh, but um, and actually it depends on so many things but the most important thing is not to overtrain the athlete and mm. in the same time do this threshold work for six to eight weeks to see a big improvements but again before these six to eight weeks you have to prepare your body to have a very good six to eight weeks so if you put uh, this kind of thing and the thresholds are here we can start working from the VO2 max stuff above the threshold long time before and aerobic on the other hand, aerobic stuff under the first threshold, then progress to slightly more specific training. So going 5% above the threshold or 5% below the threshold and then finally merge it in a very specific threshold training. Again, it's just a model, mm-hmm. but we can we, we can attack it from the upper side, from the lower side, and then finally meet in the middle with the idea that usually six to eight weeks of certain stimulus bring the most of the adaptation that's associated with the stimulus. That after that, you need to change something. It doesn't mean it's ineffective. It's just the most of the low-hanging fruits are already collected and you should change the stimulus. Maybe not intensity, but the interval framing and, you know, recovery Mm -hmm. times, stuff like that. It's really it's really interesting because um, having been in in, in in rugby as a sport and and seeing the culture and what is done and what isn't done, uh, definitely those uh, sub maximal intervals are very uh, seldom used. Right? It's uh, I mean myself, I come from from rugby originally. Then I did some indoor rowing, and I did not know what sub threshold work was <laughs> when I when I trained for for indoor rowing. Um, but definitely it's it's the type of work that essentially very few people are doing and it's probably the reason why 
it brings such good results when they actually do it. It's it's a new stimulus for them. So that's always a good a good argument for for why is something working? Well, because it's new and you're not adapted to it. So you're gonna, you know, improve faster. Uh, and I'm interested to see how this gets integrated a little bit more into those uh, more intense sports over over time and and see the effects on on recovery, on work capacity. Uh, and on on repeat sprint ability again, it, I think it's it's very interesting, and it's it's probably counterintuitive for a lot of people that this is the type of work you need to do in order to repeat your sprints more, right? Well, yeah, I'm in sport for such a long time that it's it's so intuitive to me that it's I always have to you know look very professional and be very professional not to you re- really think that um, not to treat people that's it's counterintuitive to. Uh, with some kind of distance or you know uh, foolish smiles but because yeah because uh, if you spend a lot of time in sports you see this pattern so many times that the athletes with better aerobic conditioning perform better their career life expectancy is higher Mm. they are less injury free Uh, they usually perform slightly better uh, outside of the sport because uh, these cardiovascular responses are important in so many health-related aspects, but also like recovery time, as you as you mentioned. So if you come back from the let's say amateur rugby game, and you at uh, at noon, and you are ready to have a, a nice walk with the family at two p.m., you, it's probably that this better trained endurance athletes that you can see smiling on the walk, not just you know surviving the walk. So I've seen so many different aspects of the performance that benefited from, from a solid aerobic conditioning also after the after the, the sports career. That's re- that's really interesting. The the last topic I wanted to touch on with you, Tomek, today was regarding ski mountaineering. And you've done a little bit of research in that field you were telling me just before we started recording, since we're on the topic of, of thresholds and we're talking about oxygen, let's, let's dive into it. Um, you were talking to me about uh, the, u- the utility and correct me if I use the wrong language, the utility of uh, thresholds uh, that were determined at sea level using uh, SMO2 metrics uh, and the transfer into altitude settings. So can you talk, correct me if I made any mistakes there and then talk to us about uh, what you found in those uh, in those studies? Okay, um, I think you're pretty correct with everything you, you you've said. Um, I don't want to jump to the, conclu- the the final conclusions of the studies, but what we wanted to investigate is that if the threshold established at the sea level, uh, based on SMO two, will also be useful and uh, valid if you go if you change the the altitude. Mm-hmm. So we did some research in the uh, in the in the, the hypoxic chambers. We did a very limited research in the natural environment, but obviously it would be very nice to have this kind of tool because imagine just knowing that your first our first threshold is around seventy SMO two, seventy percent of SMO two at your let's say max monitor, which can be part with your Garmin, so you can look at it constantly and during the training. And if you go for a six-hour hike in the mountains. Uh, using the skis or without the skis if it's summer, you know you, sh- you should be above the 70% to keep it very easy, to keep it, in a, let's say, maybe zone two as an aerobic mm-hmm. effort. Yeah, meaning you're, but, sorry, meaning you're actually below that first threshold yeah. because SMO2 works on a zero to a hundred arbitrary percentage scale. And the, the 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 more, the higher the number, the lower the intensity to make it very, very simple. The high, yeah, the higher the number, the lower the intensity. Mm-hmm. The more the muscles get ox- deoxygenated, it reflects the higher intensity, higher workload, and the higher mm. uh, capacity for further contraction for the muscle. But uh, imagine if you start this uh, this uh, training at 1,000 meters above the sea level, then you climb to 3,000, you go down to 800, you go back to 2,000, and then you come back home. It may uh, the same SMO2 may uh, may reflect different watts. In, on the bike or you know on, on your running power meter it may uh, it may mean different speed at different uh, altitude level but hopefully it it will be it can be calculated with smo2 that will be transferable so uh, that's something we're investigating and i'm pretty sure that there are some places where where it was already investigated um I, it's very difficult for now to tell me about the precise formula of, of transferring it we, we, at this point of the research, but it's something we definitely have some hopes for. 
Mm. And uh, and well, yeah, that's it. Does it? Can you maybe talk about how you would see it work, or or maybe I'll 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 share a hypothesis, and you can tell me if I'm going in the right direction. Uh, would going through a, a standard evaluation, where whether it's a step test or a continuous uh, RAM test in a lab with gas exchange and or lactate, obviously uh, choosing the right protocol to get valid data out of it, and then correlating where we see the inflection points in the the other metabolic data, whether it's the lactate, whether it's the gas exchange, and seeing what that corresponds to on the MOXIE, and then using that as a reference for uh, determining intensity domains using the MOXIE. Yeah, that's that's the one thing. It's like the let's say the traditional approach, mm -hmm. but we also see more more research emerging about the establishing threshold based on MOXIE uh, yeah. values, right? Uh, about MOXIE, well, SMO two values, right? So uh, so we can actually mix both approaches at this this stage of our knowledge because we have a pretty good methodology by establishing thresholds from lactate or from ventilatory mm -hmm. indices. We have an emerging uh, methodology of establishing thresholds based on SMO2 uh, values. So I think it will it will be uh, anytime soon. It will be everything will be very similar and uh, mixed. So with different uh, different athletes, we we can probably use slightly different uh, different methodologies because uh, obviously uh, some athletes have very strange elected values because of their like vascular system. Uh, there will be even more athletes with the metabolic syndrome with elevated lactate levels, especially in the amateur setting. Mm. Uh, because uh, I don't want to lie about the numbers, but I think it's like probably in adult people, 40 plus, it's like most people in the US, for example, are uh, expected or, or they, they might have a metabolic syndrome. Overall, it's maybe roughly 30%. So if mm. you think, think that one from every three adult athletes that you meet uh, might have a different or strange lactate values that it's also causes a need for another solution. Uh, and all of these methodologies have their like limitations, for example, with also the uh, fat thickness levels and stuff like that with, uh, with the near infrared spectrometry monitors. Mm. But yeah, we, we hope to, uh, to give a very clear intensity guide that it's, it works pretty well at different altitudes for the same athlete. It also can show the adaptation uh, when you come at the altitude. Imagine if you have, let's say, uh, if with the same SMO2, you might go on your bike 200 watts during the first week, or then 215 watts on the second week, and then 240 watts on your third week. And it's now it's back to like the regular levels. It means you have adapted. So you can track the SMO2 changes related to the intensity to uh, to be more be more informed about your adaptation status but we are on youtube so you know we can say that but uh, it requires more scientific validation and right. it's way more complex until it gets you know really thoroughly investigated in big sample size groups and and validated so obviously on youtube if something sounds interesting and there is a good narration into that you can sell that yeah. But uh, right now we are just, you know, discussing the hypothesis and uh, we have, we do a slightly of wishful thinking because it requires way more investigation. And I'm pretty sure that, that there will be a lot of this ambiguity and different uh, viewpoints from different researchers. But uh, from the practical standpoint, uh, it's already used uh, to some extent in the, in the, in the ways I've mentioned. It may be not 100% sure, but it also helps to make uh, decisions. And in sports, you rarely have all the information available to make a decision. So it's nothing new to us to make decision, decisions based on not full information, but just say no. Part of it, yeah. It's, we it's we have to do with what we have, and then the sports scientists have to come and back us up and give us what we are missing. <laughs> To come back to the beginning of the conversation, one, one last little question, Tomic, on that. Uh, what you mentioned there with altitude and adaptation, I've heard before, I believe it was um, um, Olav, uh, the, the coach from the, the Norwegian triathlon team that that mentioned that when we when we discussed it. And like you said, using uh, the MOXIE or using the SMO2 to compare adaptation uh, from you when you go from 
uh, from sea level up to altitude and, and how you adapt to that work. Do you see any use for MOXIE in the context of heat training and adaptation or, or not? I didn't really think about it that much. Uh, for sure, there is some, um, I don't know if it's like a common knowledge, but uh, obviously the um, vasodilation and the, 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 the blood flow in the muscles differs uh, yes. when it comes to the temperature. And I'm sure there are some limitations to the very low temperatures and using MOXIE, not associated with the technical aspects like the battery life and stuff like that, but simply about the changes in the blood flow due to for example, very low exposition to very low temperature temperatures in this peripheral uh, parts of the muscles, mm -hmm. which is a normal thing. But when it comes to the heat training, I am not aware and I really didn't think about it that much. Mm. And what are your thoughts about it? I don't have any yet. Uh, um, I've been talking to a colleague, Cyril, uh, who's been helping me. Uh, he's in France. He works with some, some elite cyclists. He does a lot of altitude camps, heat training. And uh, some of my athletes, uh, CrossFit, and also uh, I work with the, some of the Swiss team on the on the Sail GP, which is sailing, and they they do essentially a hand crank or or just a, a arm ergometer on the on the on the big boats. So uh, they they pretty much train like cyclists, but with their upper body. And uh, both Claudia, the CrossFitter, and uh, Elliot and Jeremy and um, Uh, Julien, the guys on the Swiss team, the sailing team, they're all going to Dubai. Uh, I think it's the second week for a competition there. Not the same competition, but they're there at the same time. And uh, we know that, you know, here in, in, in France, Switzerland, it's going to be maybe 10 degrees. And over there, it might be 25, 27. Um, and so we're going to put in place a, a bit of uh, heat training and try to first steps into it for, for me. So, you know, learning from Cyril and trying to apply it in a smart way and see what we can do with those different disciplines and, and the transfer. And I was just wondering, since we were talking about the MOXIE and altitude adaptation, I know, you know, core sensors, uh, we've talked about those before you and I, but uh, I know they can be used in, in this kind of setting to see adaptation to internal heat and, and whatnot. Uh, but I was wondering if you had any, uh, if you had anything on, on MOXIE and heat, I, I don't know, like you said, there's a whole blood flow thing, more blood going to the skin to radiate the heat out of the body. So is that going to have an influence in what, in a way or not? Um, if, the hydration know. Status, if the hydration status, which is way more volatile in the humid and hot environments, yes. will change. I, I don't no. know. I'm saying it will, it just probably needs to be, to be checked simply. Okay. That's another one we can put on the, we can put on the list to be checked. Uh, Tomic, that was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed Uh, having this conversation with you, diving into all those topics. Uh, it's really great to, to hear your expertise on, on all of those. Uh, what research are you looking forward to in the, in the coming weeks and months on your side? Well, I don't want to tell too much, uh, to be honest, but right now we have a pretty busy, uh, busy season in terms of like hands-on work, not research work, because it's like probably the last times of some lab testing for the winter sports. Mm -hmm. And also in the same time, the beginning of the early preparation season for the summer sport. So these are kind of uh, periods that overlap and they both are require a lot. They, well, the sports uh, use our testing at the, at the lab massively. So it's like probably the most busiest time of the week, of the year, the okay. autumn. Uh, so uh, nothing new, maybe some writing. Uh, we have some work submitted and it takes usually months to get them published. Uh, so, so I hopefully will put something new uh, during the next months. But in terms of starting new projects, it it must wait until the new year at least. All right, sounds good, man. Well, looking forward to getting another chat at some point in the future. Uh, Tomek, if people want to follow your work, where, where can they find you? Uh, well, I have an Instagram account that's Kowalski.coach, uh, and that's probably the the most social media I am. Uh, I also have a research rate account, which is like probably more more scientific approach platform, but uh, I simply you can find my published uh, peer review work there from from different journals. And since I started last year, it's not that much, but but I think uh, some things might be really interesting. Um, not only about the respiratory muscle training, but also about the testing. And now we started doing some esport research, and we have first. Uh, first manuscripts uh, put out 
so yeah probably kavalski.coach and instagram is the the fastest way so great man so we have this link uh, in the description we also have your research gate uh profile link so if people want to get in touch with you they can do it there atomic thanks so much again for coming on the podcast thank you very much for having me all right i'll talk to you soon bye bye Thanks for listening to this episode. If you would like to support the podcast, please take a few moments to leave a written review and a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. If you want to watch this episode again, you can find the full video recording on my YouTube channel. You'll also find hundreds of hours of free content, all my podcasts, my thoughts of the day, structured presentations, and more. So don't wait, go subscribe, and I'll see you in the next episode. Take care.